Hello, today I'm with Professor Nelson Wiseman, who's Professor Emeritus, uh, Department of Political Science at the U University of Toronto. He is an expert on Canadian politics and is frequently invited by the media to share his insights. Welcome, Professor Wiseman. Thank you. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the municipal election. Um, so voter turnout for municipal elections is generally generally lower than the turnout for general elections. Why is that? Well, there's a hierarchy of turnout. In Ontario, turnout in every election is highest at the federal when there's a federal election. Then it's then it's provincial elections, and then municipal elections have the lowest turnouts. There can be exceptions. Much depends on how competitive the race is. For example, in the last provincial election, which we just had a few months ago, turnout was only 43%. That was a record low. That was still higher than the last municipal election turnout in Toronto, which was, uh, I think, 38, uh, 36%. However, if you go back to 2014 in Toronto's municipal election, turnout was 60%. So why do we have these anomalies? They happen when you have an open race or what's perceived as a very competitive race. So back in 2014, we had a very, very competitive race, which was open because the sitting mayor had died, Rob Ford. We had his brother, Doug Ford, running. We had John Tory, who was the former leader of the Ontario Conservative Party. And we had Olivia Chow, who was a former MP and married to Jack Layton, who at one point was the official opposition leader in Ottawa. So these were very high profile personalities in a very competitive race that was wide open. Uh, However, the reason that th those were exceptions, the reason that this municipal election throughout Ontario, uh, the turnouts are lower than in the, in the provincial or federal election is because in the overwhelming majority of cases, you had incumbents get reelected. And that is what happens in municipal politics in a way that it doesn't happen in federal or provincial politics. And we can discuss why incumbency is such a big factor. If you'd like, I can elaborate. Yes, please. So, um, uh, Professor Wiseman, I showed you the, uh, the statistics of the um, votes for uh, Wichert Stouffville. Basically, all the uh, incumbents were reelected. Can you talk about that? Yes. The reason that incumbents have a great advantage at the municipal level is because voters don't have other signals besides the names of the incumbents. Think about federal and provincial elections where parties have candidates. And when you go in to vote on the ballot is not only the names of the candidates, but also the parties that have nominated them. So you can go in and Joe Blow is running for the Liberals and Mary Smith is running for the Conservatives and Jack Wu is running for the NDP and someone's running for the Greens and so on. So that's a signal to voters because they may not even know who the local candidates are. Oh yeah, but they know that they want Justin Trudeau or Jagmeet Singh or whatever. and they're leaders of those parties. So they vote for that party, that candidate. At the municipal level, that isn't the case. So what, it, uh, uh, so what is it that people base their vote on? Well, they might know the candidates. The larger the municipality, the less likely they are to know them because you've got that many more doors to knock on or telephone calls to make. and. So a lot of people go, oh, they recognize the name because the mayor's name has been in the media, presumably sometime in the last four years. And councillors' names also appear from time to time. So you figure, well, you know, the world hasn't fallen apart. The municipality hasn't fallen apart. You just take off that name. 
so that's a, a big factor for incumbents. Okay, so what about, there were a number of candidates who ran um, for the first time. How could, for the next election, what could they do to have greater name recognition? Well, that's challenging, uh, but they can. They start joining and becoming leaders in community groups, in various organizations, or they participate in in groups that, um, you know, there might be a Rotary Club, a Lions Club, uh, all kinds of activities. There could be a curling club and it, it, um, or a business um, development area. And that's one way to meet more people. It's a matter of networking. And uh, you could spend time uh, trying to go door to door, although I think a lot of people would be put off if, you know, somebody just shows up at the door to talk about municipal issues and here you are, you just had an election. They don't want to hear from anybody. They may not want to hear from anybody again for three years and they're not used to people coming to their door. So campaigning has also changed. They can uh, create a website, although getting traffic to it will be a challenge of, in and of itself. So there are various things they can do. They can recruit people who will also talk them up as, poten as a potential candidate. Uh, but it is a challenge at the municipal level. One of the interesting things that happened in Toronto, uh, you know, people asked me what was the biggest surprise in the election. And I said, I, I didn't notice any surprises, but there was a big surprise in the election campaign. So what was that? Well, it was the death of an incumbent counselor, Cynthia Lai. Now, there were three people already on the ballot besides her running. I have a feeling had she died, it, it was a tragedy that she died, but had she died before nomination day, I think you would have had a lot more people contesting that ward because it would have been an open contest. As it turned out, only three people besides her were contesting it. Well, because she's deceased, her name was still on the ballot. The ballots had been printed. She just died a few days before the vote. What happened is uh, a lot of, uh, then it, it became much more open in that sense. And people went in and they, many of them didn't recognize any of the names. So if you had done some work, that would have helped you. Uh, and so that was, I thought, an interesting uh, ripple during the uh, Toronto election campaign. So we have a new councillor from, I think it's Ward 23, which I don't think we would have otherwise had because Cynthia Lai would have had this massive incumbency benefit. What's, uh, is there a percentage that is considered a healthy voter, tur voter turnout for a municipal election? So if we go back to the stats for Richard Stouffville, uh, eligible voters was 35,170, ballots cast 12,023, uh, and so that's about a voter turnout of 34%. Well, is that a healthy turnout? You know, well, you're using the word healthy. I'm a contrarian. And you're using the word healthy, which implies that the higher the turnout, the healthier something is. I'm uh, my to begin with. If we compare uh, the Stovall turnout to the rest of the province municipally, it doesn't fare badly. In a number of uh, municipalities, the turnout was in the mid twenties. In Toronto, it was around thirty percent. So Stovall is above Toronto's average. Uh, there is a long-term trend going down. A lot of people are concerned about this. I'm not one of them. And that's because uh, to me, democracy is a lot more than the number of people that show up at the polls. Uh, and let me explain. I don't think there's great virtue in encouraging people to vote who know nothing about the candidates, nothing about the issues, 
and walk into a polling booth and don't recognize any of the names or have any interest and just throw a dart at the names. That's an empty gesture. If we want higher voter turnout, there are a number of things that can be done. The one thing that about two dozen countries in the world do is they have mandatory voting. So you have, look, we have mandatory taxation. You got to pay taxes, sales tax, income tax, property tax, and so on. If, if uh, voter turnout is so important, so-called to the health of the democracy, because we know taxes are, legislate mandatory voting. Now, how does this work in other countries? Do we really want to impose fines on people? Well, the fines don't have to be high. And if you have a decent excuse that you can't vote, you can, uh, uh, then, then you don't vote. You, that's accepted. Yeah. So in a country like Australia, where they have mandatory voting, turnout is still only about 80%. And we've had a lot of federal elections in Canada where turnout has been 80%. And we've had higher than 80% in a number of provincial elections, but these are years ago. Another way you could encourage voter turnout at the municipal level is if we had party politics at the municipal level, because then people would have those signals. So the question comes up, why do we have party politics at the provincial and federal levels but we don't at the municipal levels. And incidentally, a lot of people don't like that we have party politics anywhere, federally or provincially. But I'm posing the question, why don't we have party politics municipally? Because I've already said that I'm confident that would increase voter turnout. The reason we don't have party politics at the municipal level is because I'm going to use this term, but I'm going to define it. There's no confidence convention. What does that mean? A confidence convention means that the counts that the mayor or the executive would have to have the confidence of the council to continue governing. Like in Ottawa and at Queens Park, if the government is outvoted, on a financial bill or on a bill that it says is a matter of confidence, if the government is defeated on it, then we have to have an election or the government, this has happened sometimes, the government resigns and somebody else takes over. At the municipal level, that isn't the structure of the institution. So the council you've just elected in Stouffville could vote against what the mayor wants five times over. They did in Toronto to Rob Ford, they kept beating them on election, uh, on issue after issue. Rob Ford didn't have to resign or his executive committee because we know the election wasn't going to be until 2018. And we know now that the next municipal elections aren't going to be until 2026. So in, in that context, that's why also a lot of the candidates running, they don't want party politics because that would limit their freedom and independence. Because once you have a party, the party generally agrees on a common platform. And uh, hey, you might, you might agree with this part of the platform, but not that part of the platform. Oh yeah, but the party, you know, are you going to stay in the party or not? As an individual municipal councillor, well, you know, you could vote with the mayor on this, but maybe on this other issue, you won't vote with them. And you can build alliances that way, different kinds of alliances. When you get party politics, there isn't nearly as much cross-party voting. You vote with the party line, at least that's, and that's become stronger and stronger in federal and provincial politics. Once upon a time, uh, a lot of people didn't vote according to their party. Never, they didn't get thrown out of their caucus. But more and more power has gravitated to the premier and the prime minister and the other party leaders. Because in federal and provincial politics, if you want your name on the ballot with the party's name next to it, the leader of the party has to sign your nomination papers. When you run municipally, you know, you might need 20 signatures, 25 signatures, whatever. 
but it's not dependent on one person, on a leader. So you can go in your neighborhood and get a few uh, neighbors to sign your nomination, get your wife to sign the nomination, or husband, or grant, or father, or and you're in you're in business. You're on the ballot. Thirty one people ran for mayor in Toronto. <laughs> okay, can we look at the stats for um, Whitchurch Stouffville's uh, election? Um, so we talked about eligible voters. 35,000 voter uh, ballots cast, 12,000. Um, and then the number of people who voted for mayor, 11,855. Do you want to comment on some of these numbers? The number of people who are running for mayor as well? Well, a lot has to do with, uh, it's not surprising that the incumbent mayor, Mr. Lovett, got over half the votes because of name recognition. And I found it revealing when I learned that Mr. Altman had been a former mayor. So he came second because he had also um, a name recognition, maybe not for people who have moved into the constituency in the most recent years or have come of age of a voting age in the most recent years. Mark Carroll, who ran third, apparently had also been on council in the past. So it's not surprising that those are the uh, top three finishers. I don't know the background of Anand Date. I don't think this person was on council before. And he ran, he ran for, uh, Anand Date, he ran for mayor last term. Right, well. so that he ran for mayor and also I suspect didn't get 9% last term but got 9% this time because he ran last time. And so he got some publicity, not much, and then um, continued probably some campaigning over the course of four years. As for Sher Ahmad, I suspect this is a person who's never run for council before, has thrown his right. name in, only has 152 votes, uh, without taking away anything from any one of those votes. There were, uh, you know, almost 12,000 cast and had 1%. And I suspect if Sher Ahmad decides to run uh, next time and four years from now, maybe the percentage will go up to 4%, 5%. will also depend on what the person does between now and then. Mm -hmm. Okay. As for the councillors, as for the councillors, I understand everyone is an incumbent. Well, yes. it's interesting that every single one of them got more than half the votes. So uh, that again reinforces the idea of incumbency. If you had parties, it, it would probably be a lot more divided and you'd have switches because often the wind is behind the back of one party or another party and that's why in federal politics you sometimes can have you know when the in Mulroney Campbell government went down to defeat every single one of their MPs and they'd had you know almost 200 lost their seats except one that just never happens in municipal elections um, can we go to the stats for Ward 5 councillor? So Richard Bartley, the incumbent, he got about over 58%. Laura Cusack, first time candidate, she did pretty well, 41%. Yes. Any comments about that? No, but you only candidate. have two candidates there. Was there any other ward in which there were only two candidates? I don't see it. Yes. Uh, count ward 3. War two. Yes, and uh, it was similar in Ward, uh, where Mike Humphreys ran second in Ward three, and in Ward two, which was a tighter race, it was also similar. Mm -hmm. So when you get um, just a two-person race, uh, Yes, the incumbents won, but there's a very good chance that you're not splitting the anti-incumbency vote. 
mm-hmm. which is what does happen, what, which is what did happen for mayor, where he had 26 mm-hmm. here, 11% there, 10% here, and uh, the sitting mayor got just 52%. Mm. Okay. Can we go down to the trustees? Um, so for the York Region District School Board, uh, actually the incumbent was not the winner. It was a uh, first time candidate, Melanie, Melanie Wright, who won. Right. And the incumbent was okay. Elizabeth. Elizabeth Terrell, it says here. Yes, yes. Okay, well that's interesting. So why is it that you, and you know what, I understand also in Toronto that half the, half of the Toronto school board trustees weren't incumbents. So why is that the case? And that's because school board trustees have even lower profiles in the media than do councillors. So I know when, uh, uh, so, a lot of people, including myself, when I went to vote yesterday, I didn't know any of the people who were running for school trustee. So you could say, oh yeah, I should have gone out as my wife did and did research on them. She got online, she found out who they who, who it was, they looked, she looked at their biographies. But most people don't do that. And I'm a political junkie and I didn't do it. So in effect, I essentially threw a dart at the list. That can happen here. Now, I suspect what Melanie Wright did, because she, in a race with a lot of people, one, two, three, four, five, I see, uh, six, six in total, she off, and, and she got over a third of the vote. She obviously did a lot of legwork in terms of, and I don't think, you know, it just happened on uh, beginning the day of nominations. I think she had decided she was going to run quite a while ago. You may want to interview her. And she started working in the community, uh, going to parent-teacher association meetings, because I suspect she's a, a parent. But she might, I don't know if teachers can run. And and uh, felt very strongly and got some following in the community. And that I suspect explains her success in the context of where uh, many people going to vote have no idea who the school board trustees are or what they do. You mentioned that a lot of voters, they don't know that much about each of the candidates. Um, What could the town do to make the candidates better known? It could, uh, well, it's a matter of resources. The town could uh, put money into advertising and running their biographies, buying time on local television, uh, uh, putting in in local newspapers. But should that be the job of the council to make candidates that are known? You know, sometimes you have people running because they have a business interest. They want their name out, you know, they want you to go to uh, to use Joe Blow's hardware store. Well, if Joe Blow also decides to run, now people see the name and they may think, oh, Joe Blow's an upstanding businessman in the community. I'm going to use his hardware store. So uh, no, my, at, my attitude on, on voting behavior or, or what should be done is that the job of the municipal council, in my opinion, and the clerk is to facilitate voting. It's not to browbeat people and tell them, no, no, you go out to vote or you're a bad person if you don't vote. If that's how you feel, hey, if that's how politicians feel, change the law, you know, make it mandatory. But obviously they don't. And one of the reasons they don't is because uh, they prefer lower voter turnout because it's more likely the waves won't be won't be won't be waving and they'll get reelected. You're more likely to get reelected when everything is low profile, little controversy. What would you say to voters who are um, debating whether to vote or not? What would you say would be, would be the importance of voting to them in a municipal election? 
Well, it's up to them if they want to vote. That's the system we have now. Look, a lot of people are very busy. They've got kids they got to pick up at school. They, yeah, they're, and they have to work extra at the office because something happened. It's a bigger priority for them to go out. It was a beautiful day. They had a golf game lined up. They're not going to miss it. Uh, some might feel, well, you know, I could vote, but hey, no, no, I'm not going to miss my golf game. So uh, I, I sort of feel it's it's the individual decision. And you know what? I like that. It, we've got freedom. Nobody's compelling me to vote like they just did in uh, in a couple of regions of Ukraine where you had soldiers coming from door to door, apparently with guns and saying, shouldn't you be now voting? Well, hey, that's intimidating. And on the other hand, you know, well, so you're not compelled to vote. And if you don't want to vote, you're essentially saying, I'll accept what my fellow citizens do. If it really gets bad, you'll end up going out to vote. Maybe you'll run yourself. Would you encourage more people to run as candidates in the municipal elections? Mm, my own view, you're asking my opinion, I'm not giving you my analysis. My own view is that's up to them. If they want to run, they should run. I think some people are more natural at politics than others. They have natural charisma. They work really well with people. They're excellent listeners. They know they're articulate and, and are sharp and understand what the issues are and have an appreciation for both the big picture and details and other people don't have those skills. And I want good people to, uh, to run, but it's in our demo democratic system, anybody can run, but there are upsides and downsides in, in a system where the uh, franchise is so broad which is that you can also get the tyranny of the majority and you can also get uh, swept up by a madman or a mad woman as has happened tragically if you look at the history of the 20th century okay thank you is there any other um uh any anything else you would like to share with us dr uh professor wiseman I wish your network well, and I think you're doing the service by covering local politics. Because at one level, all politics is local. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Wiseman. Have a great day.